So concavity, you have all this in your notes. If you don't, I post the notes every time, so don't be scared. We've figured out that second derivative tells us something about concavity. Can keep up, can keep down, and point of inflection, if any. So if a function is differentiable in open interval, and derivative is increasing. Derivative is increasing. That means second derivative is positive, right? So if fourth derivative is increasing, that means fifth derivative is positive, and so on. So there's a connection between those two things. If second derivative is positive, smiling, smiling face, then the function is can't give up on that place. If second derivative, if the first derivative is decreasing, means second derivative is negative. Then it's a grumpy face. That's at least how it's a fun way to memorize it. Then it's can't give down. If a point change concavity is called inflection point or point of inflection. And we learned the test. Second derivative positive or negative gives you can give up, can give down respectively. If a point change to concavity is point of inflection. So those are very important things to know. Uh, the more shapes we learn, the more properties they have. So in calculus three, we're gonna learn that things have different surfaces, that the surface of my wallet, this one is pretty, and this one is important with my documents, right? So we're gonna learn that in calculus three, what does it mean to have different surface? Boom, now it's one more thing. So we have increasing, decreasing behavior, can't keep up, can't keep down behavior. We'll have surface uh, upwards and downwards. Positive orientation of you walking around some surface or negative orientation. We're gonna have, can, a pretty cool gradient ideas in calculus three. And finally, we're gonna go to viscosity in calculus three and how much things are thick when you go through them. Like your blood should have should be pretty thin if you drink enough water, and if not, it's getting thick and you might have a tumor, and so on. And in calculus three, we're gonna learn vector fields, magnetic fields, things that are shrinking in or stretching out, what kind of function and what equation tells you that. And the, the number will be positive and big, shrinks fast and, and a lot. <coughs> positive and small, shrinks slowly. So that could be amazing. All of those are properties of behaviors. And the more we learn, the more it is interesting. I did example last time about something else, uh, washing your hands, that's from medical point of view. But I always tell business students example of the fidget, or we, learn, we call it spinner at the beginning and became a fidget. When these guys show up right away, they blew up in the market. Everyone wanted to have them. Everyone bought them. They were like $7 each, even though in China it was 25 cents each. I just was, I was traveling in China when it was there first. And I thought, wow, that is so cute and very nice thing. Then I came to America, it was not there yet. Then it came like that summer and blew up. So some speeders have illusions, some are doubles, and some are have like, popping things. Everyone bought them. So the profit of selling spinners increased and it was increasing with increasing speed what does it mean the first derivative is positive but also the first derivative is increasing so the hiking becomes uh, faster and faster it's harder and harder to hike this if the first derivative increasing it means second derivative is positive can't give up increasing with increasing speed then people got tired of fidgets and like how many do you need Especially if they made well, they will last you for five years. Well, you buy one, maybe two for your sibling, maybe three for like a small present on Christmas that nobody wants to. So you still buy it though. You still buy one more, but now you don't buy it massively like you did before. So profit increases, but the speed slows down. Do you see what I'm talking about? It's going up. My pencil is going up, <coughs> but the speed slows down. That means the first derivative is still positive, but the first derivative is now not, mm, no, but the second derivative becomes negative, indi indicating that even though there's an increase, it's increasing with decreasing speed. That's a cool idea, increasing with decreasing speed. You're still running towards school because you're late, but now you're slowing down because you're out of breath. That's a cool idea. Do you see the shape, change of the shape? This is inflection point. Something happened around this point that right before that, the function was concave up. If I pour water on the graph of this function, it will collect some water. And after that, it became concave down. The water will fall off. That is your point. So something happened with business that everyone was buying fidgets. At some point, they slowed down buying them. They were still buying them, but they slowed down. 
So in business, it's important to notice this point, realize that the profit is still happening, but not as fast as before, and make some changes to continue the growth. And what changes can you guess people do when it comes to marketing and comes to selling products and whatever? Reduce the price. Reduce the price and announce it. Black Fridays, Black Fridays, nobody cared about, nobody cared about that fidget, okay? And then Black Friday says 20% off, poof, right? Like that uh, definitely works that. And there's a whole mathematics behind what is the best Black Friday sale should be. Not too much, laptop was $700. You don't want to drop it to $200. Is $350 good enough? Is $400 good enough? Well, can I leave it $699? Eh, nobody cares about that. So there's an optimal moment of that. And we're going to learn about optimization problems literally next chapter after we finish this. So more ideas, decreasing this price. But what if like you don't want to? Any other ideas? Quality, maybe. So Quality, I guess. So yeah, but kind of already have a fidget, you know? So a good example was Coca-Cola. Everyone had Coca-Cola. It was not very interesting anymore. And then suddenly everyone started buying it a couple of years ago because they changed something. They put names on it. Like, who cares that the Coca-Cola has a name Michael, but suddenly you have friend Michael and you buy them Coca-Cola. And like, will you marry me phrase could be collected in the puzzle. Who cares? So in our culture, we also had names. And it was like, Alexander, or like, Yuri. And that was there for sure. Samantha, you know. <laughs> so... It was in all cultures, Russian, Ukrainian, Chinese. They put names on the bottle. Suddenly everyone liked it, started buying Coca-Cola. So clever ideas, uh, you know. The point is you need to wait for this point. Why would you change anything if everyone is obsessed with your product? You catch this point and now you get together with your team and figure out the new ideas. So you need to have more ideas for marketing. That's what we did last time. And we're going to move to the next chapter, which is basically continuing the same thing we just did, called graphing functions or analyzing functions. It's also called 4.4. You don't have to copy all this. 4.4 uh, curve sketching. You need to know how to sketch the curve without your calculator. It doesn't mean I will take your calculators away. But in my age, back in my age, we were not allowed to use calculators. Not only my calculator did not graph, but we also did not allowed, were not allowed to use any. So five times 17, you have to do it by yourself. So how to graph? Like, how do I know what X to the four, one half looks like? How does that look like? How come I might know what is ln X over three X squared looks like? I need to have this intuition. If you engineer, especially, and physicist, especially architect people, you need to know how things look like as, as the intuition. Some kind of sense. Yeah, you have to have a sense of it. Don't rely on technology too much. Besides, technology fails often. And I'll show you that uh, example later. I gave you this in your notes, so you don't have to do it. But this is my very nice step-by-step -step explained guidance to for how to graph stuff. And that's your homework. It's like four problems, but this is the number of steps. If you follow my steps, you should be fine. Step one, identify the domain. That's important. Where are you working on? If I'm collecting the number of grandmothers going to the sale in Sprouts in the mornings, that, sh that means X should be positive. It should not be zero. Grandmother's definitely going to show up for the sale in Sprouts. So those ideas, like all the marketing relies on these ideas. When young people come, when old people come, the sale, what does it mean, and so on. Find the intercepts. Those are Y and X intercepts. If you don't remember what it is, it's actually very simple to remember. Let me do this. Set y equals to zero for x intercepts and x equals to zero so for y intercepts. It's always the opposite. And solve. That's when you know if your graph of the function goes through x and y axis. Those are called also roots. If you find where the function is zero, those are called roots of f. Symmetry. What if your function is symmetric? That's an extremely important property and you just did not care. Well, you should check it out. Symmetry is not, mm, so for example, parabola is symmetric. That means you might fold it and it becomes the same piece, like a butterfly. Or the symmetry may be like this, one over X shape, hyperbolic shapes are also symmetric. Then you don't have to bother to draw the whole thing. You draw half of it and copy paste another one or reflect it. Symmetry comes from even and odd functions, not evil, even. 
for even functions, write this down, that's kind of important. I'm pretty sure you don't remember. When you plug minus x into the function, if it is even, it swallows it. So the answer will be f of x. I have like two major examples. What even functions do you know out of your mind? Just a second. People at the back, what even functions you know out of your mind quickly? Like what's people who are talking? Yes, even functions. Yeah, don't shoot me. <laughs> yes, what do you want to say? Cosine is even. Cosine of minus x gives you cosine x. Very good example. If you don't remember cosine and sine, then x squared will be your friend. x squared. Guess what? You plug minus x squared, it gives you x squared if you properly use parentheses. So minus x squared is x squared. So parabola is a very nice example. And you remember the graph of parabola better than cosine, I'm pretty sure. When you fold it using y-axis, it gives you the same thing. So that's a nice symmetry. Odd functions, when you plug in negative sign, it spits it out. f of minus x is minus f of x. And since we worked on cosine, you can guess that sine of minus x gives you minus sine x. Sine is odd. And the other function uh, on top of the x square we can think of minus x cube. Minus x cube is minus powers x cube. And the graph of that function, we also know that. X cube is a chair, but not a tangent chair. It doesn't have any asymptotes. So, see? If I fold it using first and third quadrant, you see the symmetry. symmetry if I fold it nicely and reflect it. And also sine and cosine. If you fold cosine, it matches very well. If you fold sine, it matches diagonally. So check that. Periodicity. Sometimes we will ask you, sometimes not. What if function is periodic? How to check that? Plug x plus p. p can be anything, some kind of uh, natural number. One, two, three. If it gives you still f of x, then it's periodic. It's like mm, sine of x plus pi. Those, uh, or actually even, yeah, two pi is pretty. Two pi. You find the period of functions, if they have. Not many functions have period, though. Uh, mostly trigonometric functions are there if there's a period. Asymptotes, that's what we learned at the beginning of this class. Vertical and horizontal asymptotes. And I'm going to review for you vertical asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes are easier in my point of view. You right away find the limit at infinity. Limit x goes to infinity. And it's better give you a number. So you can n. Or a number, basically. F of x. Find the limit at infinity and minus infinity. Let's do plus and minus. And it can be different numbers. But what's happening in the long run with my age? Nothing really. It just gives you some last point. So that's not very an asymptote. But what's happening with the, uh, let's see, what are cool examples? Predator prey models, the relationship between fro foxes and rabbits. The foxes eat rabbits, uh, rab shrinks amount of rabbits in the forest, foxes cannot survive, shrink amount of them. Rabbits reproduce now, there's no more rabbits, more rabbits, more foxes, and the cycle repeats. So in the long run, it has a stable point. It goes nicely to the stability. So that's the idea. You check on the left and you check on the right to see if there's any asymptote. VA usually is denominator equals to zero, remember? So it's like one over zero cases. If that gives you a number, that is interesting. Dividing by zero is uh, not possible, but we're dividing something very close by zero and gives you a finite number. So find denominator equals to zero. That might indicate a VA, vertical asymptote. And we did this before, so that's not new material, but it is material of this class. To be honest, right after periodicity, this is where calculus starts. That's calculus one. Find first and second derivatives, we learned that. Find critical points and inflection points, we learned that. 
And now you start answering everything. You answer the interval of increasing and decreasing. We're going to do it right now. We're going to do it before. Where the function is can't give up, can't give down. You answer the questions about inflection points, local mean maxes. And then you plot the graph. You can use software or you do it by hand. Let's do the example. So I gave you those notes. You don't have to copy them. But you see everything I circled in blue over here? That's calculus 1. Sketch the curve. Can you do that before, be, without the graphing calculator? So the answer is yes. With the knowledge we taught you, you can. That's a cool idea. You might be a little bit off, but we did teach you how to do it. So you can do that. And I have a very nice video for another function uh, if you want to see how your homework is done. The function is 2x squared all over x squared minus 1. The first step is domain. Let's check domain. What is your domain? What is not your domain? Your domain is fine. What is the domain of this function? All real numbers except 1 and negative 1. Except 1 and negative 1. How do we know that? Let's see where the denominator is 0. x gives you plus and minus 1. Don't forget negative 1. Thus, domain, domain is from minus infinity to minus 1. Do not include anything. From minus 1 to 1. From 1 to plus infinity. So you will see two ways of indicating it. Uh, this is the appropriate way and the popular way. X cannot be plus and minus 1. So that's the one students like and I like also. But you need, to, you need to know how to use interval notation. Or like you said, real numbers except 1 plus 1. That's the R and you indicate as an interval. Good. Mm -hmm. No, include points of discontinuity in the sign lines. Oh, that's later. Now, second uh, step. Let's keep going through the steps I mentioned. X and Y intercept. X intercept. Do you remember what I said you should do if you want to find X intercept? Set Y equals to zero. Y equals to zero. While Y intercept is the other way around x equals to 0. That's easier because you just plug in 0 for the y. But the first thing you need to solve, because we have a fraction, maybe put it in, this, in the box so you can visually see it all the time. Because we have a fraction, only numerator will give you zeros. So x equals to 0, x equals to 0 is my y-intercept. And then when I plug 0 for, that's my x-intercept. When for y-intercept, when I plug 0, it gives you 0. y equals 0. That's my y-intercept. So 0, 0 point end up to be the point of intersection of the current graph with the x and y axis. So it goes through the zero, zero, and nothing else. That's nice to know. Make sense? Three. Let's check if the function is symmetrical. So to check symmetry, let me write down symmetry. I'm going to plug f of minus x and see what's going to happen. If nothing happens at all, it's just not symmetrical at all. But there are other two options. It might swell of it or might spit it out. Then it is symmetrical. Two plugging into the function minus x minus x squared over minus x squared minus 1. People who are bad with parentheses, now you see it's so important. You need to be better with parentheses. And the answer is 2x squared over x squared minus 1. Is this the same function we started with? Yes. So just compare it with your box. It's the same function. So people usually put equals f of x. Bless you. f of minus x gave you f of x. Is it x squared type or x cubed type? Which one is that? x squared function, which is even, or cube function, which is odd? x squared. So it's even. Or remember cosine. It's even. This function is, let me just write down even function. Okay, now we know that we only need to draw half of it and then the other one will be like a butterfly because it's an even function. 
And is it still number three or not? Number three, oh, periodicity is part of this. Number three and number three, periodicity. Periodicity comes from plugging uh, some period, x plus p, into the function and see if anything happens. No, it's, uh, well, I guess I can show you. Equals x plus p squared, x plus p squared minus one. It does not equal the original one for any kind of p, so no period. No period. So it's not periodic. Period means period, periodic functions like sine and cosine have waves and so on. Now calculus one starts. That's what we did. Uh, the August and August even. We did asymptotes already. So calculus. Calculus. Every time I say calculus, it doesn't sound right. right. Somehow I don't say calculus, right, the word cal calculus. Uh, every time I say it, nobody understands what I say, so I say math. But the problem is when I say I do math, there were questions about it, especially when I was living in Georgia first, because I arrived to Georgia in America. And it would, the police would, would stopped me because the light did not work. Like, ma'am, where are you coming from? I'm a graduate student from the university. Well, what do you do there? I do math. And that was a little bit awkward. And I don't, I did not understand why at the moment. So then I went to Utah and they would ask me, oh man, what do you do? Oh yeah, I do math. They thought it was a religious math. Cause that's how I say it. I say like there are three different masses. Okay. A T H E T H, right? <laughs> and M. How do you say the religion? How do you write religion math? S S like this. So y y y Mormons in Utah religiously do lots of mess, Sunday mess. So then I realized all of this is wrong. So I started saying calculus, but then I say calculus is not right. So there's a whole lots of misunderstanding of what actually am I doing? I do math. So you guys engineers, you do engineering, no questions asked here. It's very convenient. Or computer scientist also, you code. If you ask parents, if parents ask you like, I I'm coding, yeah, just say that. Nobody asks questions about that. Architects, obviously, building. We're going to find VA first because we already found it. VA, set a denominator equals to zero. Well, it's going to be x squared minus one equals to zero. We already did that. X is plus or minus one. Those are your two VAs. You have two vertical asymptotes. At plus and minus one. That means the function will be approaching there infinitely, but will never reach it and will never cross it. Because you shall not pass, joke, remember? It cannot cross VA. However, it actually can cross HA. Horizontal asymptote comes from the limit as X approaches plus or minus infinity of the original function in the long run. That's how we say it. What is happening in the long run Long lasting behavior, I saw that also. But the short phrase, in the long run. Well, that's uh, now asks if you remember what the heck is going on here. What is this LIM? Do you remember? Limits, uh, that was like long time ago. And you did not like it, obviously. <laughs> what is the answer? Is it two? People at the back, do you think it's two? Let's, I don't know. Let's check that. So you find the leader of the top, 2x squared. You find the leader of the bottom, x squared, because we're working with polynomials. Compare the speed, 2x squared over x squared gives you two. The answer is the ratio of the leading coefficients. Another way of doing it, do you know? The recent way we learned a couple of weeks ago, L'Hopital's rule also is good. So either you do the fast way, I, which I taught you, or you recognize it's infinity over infinity case. And then you take derivative of the top because it's going to be a L'Hopital's rule. And then you will have 4x over 2x. x cancels out, 4 over 2 is 2. So L'Hopital rule definitely is there. Does it matter if it's plus or minus the infinity? No. Still the answer is 2. Thus, 
horizontal asymptote is the same on the left hand side and the right hand side. To introduce you to this notation, it's called a long run. What is happening in the long run, long term behavior. So let's write down y equals, let's make it on the right, y equals 2, put it in the box, that is HA, horizontal asymptote. Questions about this? Ideas, suggestions, is it too fast, is it too slow, too funny? Five, that's where we start working with new material, which we just finished your homework. Five says, Find first, second derivative, critical points, intervals increase, decrease, inflection points. So we're going to do this all in order. You don't have to do it in order. From now on, it's actually a pretty creative process. I will rewrite the original function, so it's in here, x squared minus 1. And then I'll put it in the box. It's so my first derivative, original function, oh, it's my original function. If I want to find increasing, decreasing max mean, I find first derivative. If I want to find concavity, concave up, concave down, point of inflection, it's second derivative. So we're going to start with the first derivative. First derivative is quotient rule x squared minus 1 squared. Derivative of 2x squared is 4x, parentheses, x squared minus 1, parentheses, minus 2x squared, parentheses, times 2x. Too fast or you get it? Quotient rule. Simplify. This is the case when you need to simplify to see what's happening. And that's why sometimes we require you to simplify. It all depends on what you're looking for. If you really need to see what is the first derivative look like, you need to simplify. Minus 4x. Put it in the box. That is the first derivative. That's important. First derivative is over here. And now I want to find critical points. Critical points has a synonym. What is that? What do we do? Zero and D and E. So we're going to have zero points from the top and D and E points from the bottom because it's a fraction. So zero and D and E points. Maybe once, let me write down with you. The zero points I called stationary points, stationary points, while DNA points are called singular points, singular points. The word singularity, you heard it from the movies and some videos, that's where it's coming from. Something is happening there. The derivative does not exist. Why? Something is happening. Singularity, singular points. You don't have to know this terminology, but now you at least seen it before. Bef at least seen it at least once. Critical points. Minus 4x equals to 0. x equals to 0. Okay, that was very nice. Denominator, x minus 1 squared equals to 0. x equals plus or minus 1. We had it before, just because we squared something did not really change. Uh, vertical asymptotes here. So we have three points. But not all of them might be critical points. What is the extra step you need to do before you claim something is a critical point? Question mark. Check. What are we supposed to check? The interval. The in what? Interval. interval of what? Domain. <laughs> Domain. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Domain. There's a nice professor that was uh, checking his teaching, giving him evaluation. He always had a nice rhyme to everything. He was like, it rhymes with Romaine or something like, I don't think I'm that creative in English, but I can try. And people are like, oh, it's domain. So, mm, check, domain. Domain was, oh, I don't remember what domain was. Minus infinity, infinity, I think. No, what was the domain? X was not. Plus or minus one. Duh. So I cannot include these two. It's actually says in the domain. Do not include these as critical points. But x equals zero is fine, right? It's actually um, was intersection for zero, zero. So we have one critical point. X equals to zero is critical point. Put it in the box. 
And then the other two points, plus or minus one, are called points of discontinuity. Points of discontinuity, which means discontinuity means function is not continuous there. And that's a tricky thing. Even though it's not in a domain, you must include them on the sign line because points of discontinuity might change the behavior of the function. Note, and I'll put it in red, maybe like pink, fat pink. Note, and that's important. Include, include points of discontinuity into or just two which one was it last time into sign line or to sign line on the sign line on the sign line exclamation mark vertical <laughs> asymptotes might change concavity vertical asymptotes might change increasing decreasing on the left, the function was increasing, vertical asymptote happened, start decreasing. Thus, even though they're not critical points, we need to include them in the sign line because they might break the behavior of the function or change. So let me number sub steps. So we had step one. Oh, no. Oh. Now I already scrolled back. So we found critical points. Step one, derivative and critical points. Here you go. Step two, sign line, sign line. Four, first derivative. That is called first derivative test. First derivative test. Sign line, I do it this way. Some of you learn to do a box. Do your box if you want, a list is fine too. I don't mind any way you know. Just make sure it's correct. I put it in a circle to make sure that it's not x-axis. It's just, it is x-axis and I'm checking sign of the de derivative. And I put first the critical point zero, that's my CP. And then I put minus, let me put it in blue, minus one and one. Those are points of discontinuity. Popular notation for points of discontinuity is to put them like so, not to forget that they were not critical points. Those are vertical asymptotes. That's a popular notation. I saw it in many places and I like it. That's like, was a lot of work and we are kind of like halfway through only. Oh, okay, 50 minutes. Oh, we can finish in 50 minutes. What do we do after this? Do you remember that was pretty new material? What do we do on this step? The homework is due tonight, remember? Wait, people at the back or people in the middle? Yes? Like plug-in points between. Exactly. Plug-in points in between those numbers. Minus one, zero, one. A good job. Who remembers the name of those points? They, they rhyme with vest points. <laughs> They're called test points. Okay, it is kind of funny. <laughs> I started enjoying it. Test points. You don't have to know the term, but whatever you said was exactly correct. You take any point between those intervals and check them. And that's why they call test points. So minus one, whatever is on the left, minus 100, minus 10, you choose whatever you want. And I usually do symmetry, minus 10 and 10. And then you plug it into derivative. So remember that. And I don't remember derivative. And that's why I put it in the box. Here it is. It's in the pink box in my case. Minus, and I don't need a number. I need a sign. And you know what's good? The denominator is always positive and not even zero. It's always positive. It's squared. So I only need to check the sign of the numerator, and that's why it's convenient to know those things. Minus 4x at minus 10 is positive or negative? Positive, because minus minus gives you plus. So it's going to be positive. Let's plug minus 0 0.5. Minus 0 0.5 and minus 4 multiplied gives you plus or minus? Plus. Now we do 0 0.5. 0 0.5 and minus 4 gives you minus and minus. And in fact, we knew that um, they should be symmetrical. We remember that. So there should be symmetry. Here you go. Now, if or re if derivative is positive, the original function is increasing. Derivative is positive, original function is increasing f. Decreasing, decreasing. And we can answer this question now. In let's put it answer. 
it's not it was not a question to be honest in this case you are analyzing the function but it's fine let's put it answer f is increasing on decreasing on increasing is from minus infinity to zero correct no you have to break the interval what is happening at minus one it's not even defined there but if you put it in the interval you claim that it is defined at minus one so minus infinity to minus one and from minus one to zero avoid the bad point decreasing from zero to one one to plus infinity so now we know that let's put it in the box what is the next answer we can do right away after this? That's why I like first to test more than second. It gives you me more information, intervals, and mean max. Do you see mean or max here? It's actually visually. That's why I like notation instead of plus minus. In the book, they teach you to memorize. From plus to minus, you have something. I don't like memorizing things. I'm a visual learner, so I like to see. you hiking up, you're hiking down. What happened over there? Max. That's local maximum. Answer. Local maximum at x equals to 0. But what is y when x is 0? Also 0. So 0, 0 point end up to be maximum. So the function will go below that, after that maximum, and before that maximum. Makes sense, whatever I just did. Second derivative test. For second derivative test, uh, guess what? You need to find second derivative. That, will, that one will show concavity. That is a step six. Well, actually, I'm just going uh, like away from the list already. Second, second derivative shows me concavity, concavity, and poi, point of inflection. Okay, so let me find second derivative. I'm kind of tempted to skip algebra, but I don't know. I think I can trust you know the algebra. Where's my first derivative? Here it is. Quotient rule one more time. X squared minus one to the four. X squared minus one squaring again to the four. And that was minus four X. Okay, I memorized. Minus four times X squared minus one. Oh, nice. X squared minus 1 squared. Don't forget, it was squared originally, so don't lose the squared. Minus, minus 4x, x squared minus, oh, that one I need to differentiate. How to differentiate x squared minus 1 squared? How do you differentiate that? Chain rule, or if you don't like chain rule, you can always do square of the difference and then power rule, but I would do chain rule. 2 goes down x squared minus 1 to the 1 times 2x. And you have to simplify all of this. And I actually did it in my notes. I was like, yeah, this was doable. You distribute everything and you simplify and you get this function. And we're almost done after that. You get the function x squared minus 1 cubed. That means uh, this guy got factored out x squared minus 1 to the power 1 got factored out and cancelled with one of the in denominators. And then everything else simplified to 12x squared plus 4. Put it in the box. That's my second derivative of the original function. We're solving it the same way we did before. Zeros. Zeros. And x squared minus 1 cubed equals to 0 gives us the same plus and minus 1 vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes are always there. So any derivative will keep showing you those. But then we have more points. 12x squared plus 4 equals to 0. x squared equals minus 4 divided by 12. x equals what? Plus or minus square root of 4 12. Uh, it rhymes with long. This is wrong. It's like not, I don't know, I might get tired of it soon. There's no solution here. Do you see that? No solution. Don't make up solutions if there's no solution. No solution. So, 
Yeah. You put sine line, so it's going to be step two. Remember, we had step one is to find derivative, set it equal to zero, D and E found it. Step two, sine line, sine line for the second derivative. Now, here's a sine line, and I'm going to put second derivative in a circle to remind me about this. And I put only points of discontinuities. Since I did not find any new points, that is fine. And guess what? The points of discontinuities will change the concavity. And that's why they're not called poi, because it's vertical asymptotes. Let's see if I'm right. Take test points. We only need three. Minus 10. Plug them back into the second derivative. Now, denominator is cubed, but it's still always positive. Is it or not? Minus 10 squared is positive. That's 100 minus 1 is positive. So denominator is still positive. The numerator is always positive. Right or no? So at minus 10, I have plus. Symmetrically, at 10, I have plus. Although you, can, you have to check the cube part. The only difference might happen in the between. Let's plug 0. 0 gives me negative. 0 0.5 also gives me negative. Do you see why? 0 0.5 squared is less than 1. That's how I know. And then whatever is less than 1 cubed gives me, whatever is negative cubed gives me negative. Does that make sense? So you can just plug it if you want to calculate stuff. But usually the faster you are, the more proud you are of yourself. If second derivative is positive, original function is... <coughs> Concave up, smiling. Positive, original one is smiling. Concave up, concave up. If second derivative is negative, the original function is grumpy. Concave down. The points that change the concavity are inflection points, unless they are not in a domain. Those two are vertical points. Not vertical asymptotes, not poi. We have all needed information to draw the graph and it's perfect five minutes left, not the poi. Let's do it. And then I'll show you a cool animation after that. Have a lot of space. It's kind of like a big uh, picture here. Here's my x axis. Here's my y axis. And then we start think plugging things we know. We know two vertical asymptotes. Don't put them too far from each other. Vertical asymptotes are happening at minus one. There's a vertical wall that you shall not pass. Here you go, vertical wall here. Can you like not? Oh, good. Vertical wall at minus one and one. VAs. VA, VA. There's a horizontal asymptote. Do you remember which one? At zero, right? Y equals zero. Two. Oh, people. Two. two. So let's put two. Don't put it too high over here. Uh, this is y equals two. H a h a came came from the limit at infinity and minus infinity. And now the hard part starts. First of all, I remember that the function had maximum at zero zero. It was not global maximum. It was local maximum. So this was local max. I remember that. Well, if it was local max, right before it was increasing, and right after it was decreasing, we can check that from the data we found. It was increasing from minus 1 to 0 for sure, and decreasing from 0 to 1 for sure. After this, I need to go and check what I had. So what is happening here? Well, I definitely see increase and decrease. We definitely covered this part. It's increasing from minus 1 to 0 going up, decreasing from 0 to 1. But it's also increasing on the left from there. Interesting. Well, we have this kind of square happening, right? It's a vertical and horizontal asymptote. So this is how it's increasing right before minus one. And this is how it's decreasing right after minus one. If we want to maintain this horizontal asymptote behavior. The first derivative is positive here and the first derivative is negative here. On my graph, this looks like this piece on the left has concave up behavior. Let's check. It should be concave up from minus infinity to minus one. Oh, we were supposed to write down the intervals. 
So it's true. The second derivative is positive here. The function is concave up on the very left. And then the function is concave down on the very right. So second derivative is negative or not. Let's check. Oh, the second derivative is positive. Makes sense. If you pour water on those two edges, it will stay there. But right in the middle, it looks sad. Concave down matches. Second derivative is negative from minus 1 to 1. The water falls off. And I also can indicate the first derivative was positive. The first derivative was negative. So we can write down in um, we can write down this question I forgot to write down that f of x is concave up up and concave down on the intervals. You guys should tell me so at least uh, someone say something. Concave up on louder negative infinity minus one and. 1 to plus infinity. You see it from the graph and you see it from this table over here. Concave up, concave up. Concave down is faster to write. It's over here, right between minus 1 and 1. And that's how you sketch the graphs by yourself without calculator. It's not very precise. I'm not sure, like, is it going like this? Is it going like more smoother or is it like barely touching the asymptotes? I don't know that. There are more things to use to find those answers. But this is sketching the graph, analyzing the function. How cool is that? If this function represents gravitational forces, that's how you analyze it. And also, do you see it's symmetrical? If I fold it as a butterfly, it matches. So it is indeed even. Yay. Good job, people. One problem for one class. And now you have four more problems to do in homework. But I did solve one of them or two in my YouTube videos. I just have one question. Yes. Uh, how do we understand that uh, it's going to be about the back section of the graph, like the upper section of the graph? Let me approach you just a second. Have a good day, people.